Good evening, and thanks for joining tonight's TI Technology webinar hosted by Texas Instruments. For tonight, I'm excited to learn about the top 10 features of the TI Inspire CX Navigator system. My name is Mike Houston, and I'm the moderator for this event. I teach algebra and calculus near Pittsburgh, where I use TI Technology to make those tough to teach, tough to learn concepts accessible to all my students. I'm really excited to be joined by our two panelists tonight, Fred Fernio and Doug Roberts. Fred's a national instructor for Texas Instruments and taught secondary school mathematics for 33 years in Peel DSB, just west of Toronto, where he used TI Technologies extensively and his schools were pilot sites for many new TI products. He was in the first group of teachers trained in Navigator at the Ohio State University in 2001 and went on to assist with the development of the TI Inspire and Navigator. Fred, it's great to have you with us tonight. Thanks, Mike. Nice to be here. And Doug taught math and computer science for 30 years at Franklin Heights High School just outside of Columbus. When retiring from the classroom, he became a systemic in-classroom coach for TI, and Doug has a wealth of knowledge with Navigator. He started working with the first prototype for TI in 1998 and has helped with all of the updates and advancements. That being said, Doug, it's great to have you with us tonight. It's great to be here to, with you, Mike, and everybody. We're expecting a large crowd, so your audio is muted. Feel free to send any questions to Fred or Doug using the Q&A window on the right side of your screen. As a reminder, the session is being recorded and we'll provide a link to the event certificate of attendance at the conclusion of the webinar. We hope you don't have any audio issues, but in the event that you do, try selecting communicate from the very top of the WebEx menu and choose audio broadcast. At this point, Fred is gonna discuss our agenda. So we, Doug and I looked at this list a little while ago, and these are the features that we think highlight this technology. Uh, we are going to, in the first part of the session, do class capture, live presenter, quick polls, sending out quizzes, and data aggregation. And we're going to try something completely different tonight. My calculator, I'm sorry, my computer has been set up with a small navigator system with an access point and five uh, calculators attached. And Doug's going to control my computer from his home in Columbus. I'm in southwestern Ontario. Um, I guess we're going to allow Doug to cross the border today. Um, and then I'm going to talk about the last four things on the items there, sending files to the class. And I'll be demonstrating that. <clears throat> Uh, talking briefly about the portfolio, talking about the transfer tool, and preparing handhelds for large assessments that everybody faces in their career. And you'll notice there's only nine things there. The tenth one we're going to talk about as we go through the session tonight. Thanks, Mike. Fred, thanks so much. A few of you might notice that there was a quick little poll that I put one question uh, on the right side of your screen. If you haven't had a chance to answer that, uh, please do so now. It's going to help guide us um, as we move forward tonight. Fred, let me give you control. And as a reminder, feel free to share your screen. So I'm going to give uh, folks here about another 20 seconds or to, so to answer that poll, and then um, I'll share the results. I just need a second to realign things here. Yep, no problem. While you're doing that, I'll uh, I'll start to close the poll out. Hey, my friend, you're in control of my computer now. Thank you, Fred. Uh, when, as Fred said, we chatted over the top 10, and, and we were going to do a, a like a top 10 list, but we didn't want to get into a fight over what should be number one and so forth. So we kind of lumped all these 10 together, uh, and we want to show you the things that we just we love about Navigator. And as like Fred said, he has a class of five calculators up there. 
And, I, and they've all been logged in, so all the students are talking to his teacher computer. So the first thing I want to do is I'm going to send this file, which is nothing more than a document that contains a uh, graph page. And I'm going to take this file and it's going to send to his five students. And of course, I'll tell the students, when you receive the file, go ahead and open the file up. Now, while Fred is doing that, his handling the five calculators, I'm going to I'm going to spy on them. I'm going to look to see, using what's called screen capture, I'm going to see what every child's calculator is doing. Okay? So I can, I, right now it's set, it's automatically going to refresh every 15 seconds. And it looks like everybody is logged in. we got one person that's not logged in. They must be absent today. Oh, and this one person here has got some issues. So I'm going to click on that. And I'm going to make the presenter because obviously they've had an issue and students at different times will have this problem. They didn't open up the file. So I'm going to give some directed instruction to Fred. Fred, would you go ahead, go to number two, browse. Because the file, they received it, it just didn't show up. Ah, there it is. It's in the folder called practice class. So go ahead, hit enter and open up that folder, Fred. And we had sent out, what's, pardon, Fred? Which one is it? It's the one called Graph Page, Fred. I'm trying to be your student. I know. And you do a good job at it. <laughs> okay. So now we have the Graph Page. So I can then stop presenter, and I go back, and I get to see all the student calculators. So I'm going to give Fred a task, and this is an easy task for Fred. Fred, I'd like the students to all graph their favorite line, whatever that is. We've been studying lines in class. Uh, I just want them to draw their favorite line. So as, as he's going through, I can also have the ability to enlarge the screens. So some of you probably at home can see that they are either way too big or way too small. There's also some commands that allow me to change the view. So I can change the zoom percentage, and I'm just going to go to fit all so that way it will take everybody's screen and maximize them on my window that I'm looking at. And it looks like Fred has, has done the task, except there's one of these things that's not like the other. One of these things doesn't belong. We've been studying lines, and oh, this, this child here obviously didn't draw a line. They drew a parabola. So again, I can make them live presenter, and then we can have the discussion on what would, what what is different from this equation of line? So, Fred, if you, would you hit the tab button, please? And then if you, you see it's on F2, but that was the first function he graphed. So hit the up arrow. Ah, there's the function that he graphed, x squared minus 3. So then we could have some discussions to realize that, oh, that, that x squared is what causes uh, the parabola. So, Fred, would you go, be so kind as to go ahead and, and delete that square? Okay, and then hit enter, and it instantaneously pops back up. So one of the two of the most powerful things of Navigator I've I've been able to show you this evening. The first one being screen capture, where I can monitor every child and see what they're doing. Can see are they on task? Have they drifted away? Have they uh, have they got a concept or something we need to talk about? So just like I would at a real class, I could oops I double clicked across the border too fast, mm -hmm. go back to the regular class. And then we can have some discussions about, well, what do you notice about all these lines? And hopefully the students would all realize that their favorite line has a positive slope. And then I can say, well, gosh, there's something special about this line down here. So if I clicked on this one and made them live presenter, we can have discussions on what, what happened with this particular person. What's special about their line? Fred, would you take this person and, and take your mouse and move it toward the line until you get a symbol that looks like a, a, a steering wheel? Scoot down the line a little bit till you get what looks to be a steering wheel. Ah, uh, Fred, once you get that, go ahead, do control center touchpad. And that acts as a grab hand and is going to grab. Now, move your, use your mouse, Fred, and 
And now you can have discussions with your kids, well, what's happening? What are we changing? And then you can have the discussions and, and talk about, oh, every child in the class can see that, oh, that little steering wheel symbol is rotating the line. But well, what's it rotating around? It's rotating around the y-intercept, and we can investigate that. Okay, uh, Fred, just one more thing. Hit escape. Okay, move your mouse along the line until you get that what looks to be a plus sign or a cross. I wonder what this does. So let's do control and center touchpad. And then as we start to grab and use your touchpad, we can see that we're actually translating the line. So the slope staying the same, we're changing the y-intercept. So we're able to use directed instruction let kids do some simple discovery using screen capture and live presenter. Very, very, very powerful tools, you know, with our students, okay? I'm gonna go ahead and stop presenter, Fred. So you can go ahead and let go. <clears throat> so I'm going to close this out just for a moment. Okay. And so I want to talk about the an, another thing that is very, very powerful, and that is assessments, whether they be uh, formative assessments or summative assessments. Assessment that you're going to put a grade in a grade book, that would be a summative assessment or formative assessment. I want to know what the kids know or don't know. And especially with kids coming back into school having missed a chunk of time because of COVID, uh, we need to make sure that we're assessing the kids to see. So I, I, I have created here a, a, a little, I'll call it a quiz, where I want to send out, I want to assess to see, uh, do the kids understand uh, some functions? So I'm going to take this file, and I'm going to send it to all five of those students. So I'm going to take the file and I'm gonna send it out to all the students. So Fred, you can go ahead and open up the file. And while you're doing that, I'm gonna go ahead and, and redo screen capture again. And then so everybody at home can see, I'm going to come up here to view, and I'm going to change the percentage to where you can see them as large as possible. Okay? And you can see Fred is answering the questions. And you don't have to an answer all for five people. So just, Fred, why don't you go ahead and answer the, the questions for at least one person. And I'm going to collect this file back. Because in a normal class, when you send out an assessment like this, the students can work at their own rate. Uh, I normally would tell my students, I would give them a certain time limit, because if you give kids an infinite amount of time, they'll take they'll take all period for something that should just take him a few minutes. And have you completed the, the six questions, Fred? I have now. You have now. Okay. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead, close out of this. And even though we just had Fred answer on one student, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to come over here and I'm going to collect it from all the students. So I'm going to collect all of their answers. And I'm going to delete it from the handheld so that next period when we do this, their answers will not be on the calculator. So we can see that the files are coming back in and I've got all the answers. So I'm going to go ahead and I want to look at their answers. And we want to have some discussion in the classroom. So I'm going to open up in review space. And there was the first question. Which of the following functions is not linear? Choose all that apply. And then we can see what Fred had, had marked. Okay. And it looks like he didn't mark, uh, he had marked uh, D, 
A and B were the correct answers. He marked A, B, and C. Okay, and we can actually change his view. Okay, to where if I do a right mouse click, I can show them with student responses grouped together so that we can see the correct answer was A, B, and D, which he didn't get correct, and he had selected A, B, and C. And we can look at the next question where we had asked, here's a list of points, which points correspond to which function? In this case, Fred got this one right, where that all of those points lie on uh, the equation y equals x plus 2. So if we had had all five calculators answer, if we had taken some more time, you would see all the entire class with every bar representing what every child had done. And the nice thing is, and I don't want to steal some of Fred's thunder, but at least I got to show you that once we've taken this quiz, we can save it in the portfolio. So I'm going to go ahead and save this into the portfolio, and Fred's going to talk more about that here in a little bit, but I've saved the answers in the computer. Did you want to say something, Fred? Nope. nope. Oh, you're good? Okay. Just, uh, just checking. <clears throat> now, there are times when, as a teacher, you don't want to send out an entire six-question, you know, quiz, and then kids are going to take forever. The nice thing is, is we can create these questions in the teacher software. And then I can just send one question out to the entire class. Let's say for some reason uh, that my students are having difficulty with uh, rep looking at the table and figuring out what represents a linear function. So out of this entire file, I can actually send this one slide out to the students. And all I would do is be come up here, there's this button called Start Poll, which is short for Quick Poll. So I'm just going to tell it to, to start the poll. And then I'm going to show you what you would see on all the students' screens. So let me do a screen capture again. And you will see that every child in the class has on their calculator that one question. So that way I could then kind of take the group, and then move them along with what they need to need to know. And it looks like Fred is quickly answering. And then all Fred has to do to, to send it back in is on the handheld, he would hit dock in the number one or dock and enter. And then all of them will then be sent back into the teacher. So now the teacher. Yep, you're done. good, because I can tell, Fred, because over here in the student data, it says zero of five are working and five of five have submitted. So that way I would know how many of the students were still typing, how many of the students have actually turned it in. So now that I know that they're all done, I'm going to go ahead and stop the poll. And now we can actually have a discussion over what the correct answer is and so forth. And I can do like I did before because I've got uh, – Nice, ugly little histogram here. So then we could break it down, and, and four of the students picked A, B, and D. One student picked A and B. The correct answer was A and C. So now that leads me that we can then have a teachable moment and go back and talk about, well, why is A or B or C the correct or not correct answer? So we can actually take the students and quickly, by using quick polls, to find any misconceptions that they may have. So that way we can nip things in the bud quickly. So the notion of a quiz, we can send out the entire document. The kids can work at their own pace. Or the quick poll allows us to send one question at a time. Now, there's also, when I was teaching, a lot of times I would, all of a sudden, a student would ask me a, a, a question, and it was just like, oh, this is, this is something I think I, all the students need to know. Well, I can quickly just click on this little ballot box. And it allows me to, to create a question very, very quickly. So I can, I can insert a question. Uh, like, uh, this is a good one for Fred. Who is going to win 
the Stanley Cup. Okay, and so I've created this on the fly because we've had this discussion, even though Stanley Cup's not about math. I can go ahead and start poll, and then students can immediately send a question out to the entire class. Let the entire class answer the question, send it back in, and then we can have that discussion. And, and again, in talking mathematics, we can actually then be trying to nip any misconceptions in the mud and, and help students uh, achieve uh, some understanding in mathematics. Uh, teacher? Yeah, yes, sir. I did something wrong on one of my calculators. Okay. Well, let me go ahead. Let's do a screen capture. Let's that way everybody can see what your mistake is. And what I normally try to do is I'll let the students help troubleshoot because I'll play this little game, I spy. Oh, hmm. This person, I think, has been the one that submitted. This one is on the question. On the question. Oh, let me bring this one up. This one looks a little different. So I'm going to make them live presenter. Okay. Now, there's something different from the standard screen. And that is option C on the left-hand side, because it says quick poll. So what has happened is Fred has accidentally got out of the quick poll, but he, when he's on the home screen, it gives him the option to go back. So Fred, all you have to do is either press the letter C on the keyboard, or you can use your touchpad to go to C or arrows. And it looks like now he's going to type in his answer. I'll minimize because I don't want everybody to know what he's going to say. Okay. I'll say, buddy, accept the leaves. <laughs> okay. So now let's look. Let me stop the poll. And let's look at our responses. Okay. We have one for Boston, one for the Oilers, one for T, one for Tampa, and one for Washington. Huh, T. Well, you started talking T, and then you stopped the poll. Oh. Tampa again. Well, the nice thing is, Fred, if, if this was a real class, my students would holler, but, sir, you you stopped the poll too quick. Or I, I, I misspelled something. Can I go back and change it? No, but just you can tell me what it was. And if I hover over a bar, it will tell me the name of the student, so that way I can actually see who picked Washington who picked Boston, et cetera. So I have a way to monitor and share with the group uh, and fix up misconceptions. Okay. Now, there's one other thing that's part of Quick Poll that's very, very, very powerful, and that is da data aggregation, to be able to collect data quickly from students so that way you can do some further investigations. Well, it just so happens I, I have created a very simple quick poll using uh, the lists of quick poll, where I'm going to send out to Fred here in a second, where he's going to get what looks to be a spreadsheet, where he's going to be asked to type the number of children that live in their household and the number of pets. And he's going to put the children in cell A1 and the number of pets in B1. And then he's going to send that back in just like he would a quick poll. So I'm going to go ahead and start poll, and I know, Fred, that you're the only one in your house right now, so you feel free to be creative with your children and pets. And I've done this with lots of students uh, in the different sites that I've been working with, uh, and I was at one school where uh, the, the gal had put down uh, three children and 247 pets, and I asked the gal, how, did you, how do you have 247 pets? And she said uh, her dad assigns her the job of counting the head of cattle every night. So she counts each one of the head of cattle at her farm as a pet. So that's why she had such a large, large number. And it looks like Fred's quickly, he's got a couple more to enter in. Because right now I see four or five have submitted, zero or five is working. That means one other person hasn't started typing yet. 
They're started to type. Once they finish, I've got the answer. So I'm going to go ahead and stop poll. Okay. Oh, so we have our nice little chart here where I've got children and I've got pets. And it's, it's in a little frequency table. But, boy, wouldn't it be nice if, if, if I collected this data quickly from the students of being able to send it back out so that way we could do some type of, of scatter plot or some type of graph of some type? Well, I can with Navigator. I can take this data and send it back to them. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to do a right mouse click, and I'm going to tell it to uh, send table to new document. And what it does is now create opened up the list and spreadsheet page. It created a column called children, a column called pets. And now at this point, I can send this file back out to the students. And then once these students open up the file, and Fred, you can just pick one student to open up the file, because I want to show them that they, this, they do get all the data back from every student. And I'll make that person live presenter so they can see them large. Oh, you did it, all of them. You are the man, Fred. I'm the, trying to be an overachiever. Had to be an overachiever. Okay, so now you saw that every child had this data. So now I can now have the students then continue on and use the power of the Inspire to do a scatter plot and to do other types of analysis of children and pets to see, is there a correlation? Uh, one of the activities that I always love to do with my students would, would we would, I'd give them tape measures and we would measure the, their height, their arm span, their hand span, uh, the distance from the elbow to the wrist. And then we would enter those into that uh, list and spreadsheet, collect it, and I'd aggregate it, send it back out. And then we'd look to see, okay, well, based on this class, w which uh, components have, have relationships? which has a positive correlation, which has a negative correlation. So we were able to, to talk about those things before we started getting into regressions uh, and, and so forth. So, I, Fred, I, I, I've covered the first, first five biggies, which again, to me, this is what sells Navigator, is, is, is to be able to screen capture every kid, to be able to use Live Presenter to, to let kids teach kids and for us to uh, do some directed instruction, to do formative sum of assessments with quizzes, to also do quick polls, to, to do that instant check, and, uh, and data aggregation. So to me, I, I've already hit the top five, Fred. It, it's time for you to, to, to take the bottom, bottom five. So, Fred, <laughs> I, I'm going to let you take control of your computer back, and I'll let you talk about the other five. Okay. Yeah. I need to take control away from you. Yes, you do. Okay, so I'm back in play here. Um, when we prepared the list, I mentioned that there were only nine on the slide that came up a little while ago. The tenth one Doug has touched on a couple of times, and I'm going to expand on that right now. I find that Navigator is somewhat of a class management tool. Uh, you notice a couple of times I intentionally had kids not participate, not follow instructions. And the idea that you can take a, a snapshot of their screens at any time um, keeps that engagement level up. And I found when I was using uh, Navigator with the TI-83s and 84s before I retired, and since then with the coaching that I do, that Navigator keeps things on pace a little bit better and children cannot hide out like they, they tend to do sometimes in a math class. The other thing with classroom management, and this was a complete surprise to me, the last semester that I taught, I was teaching a couple of sections of calculus, and I did the types of quizzes that Doug said every day. And I got into the habit of I would teach something on Monday, I would take it up on Tuesday, and I would have a quiz when they walked in on Wednesday. So they always had a quiz on the material that we covered two days prior to that. And once we got into that habit, the kids knew when they walked in the room that they had to uh, get the calculators, get going on the quiz because it was timed and it was easy marks. 
Um, what I didn't know was two things. I said to them, if you're not there when the class starts, you're not getting the quiz, you're going to have to come back and see me later in the day. And it turns out that that was a fate worse than death because nobody wanted to see me twice in one day. So they were in a hurry to get to class. And the principal came up to see me and she said, I would like to know why the grade 12 kids are in a hurry to get to your class every day. And I said, that's just because they love me so much. Um, she didn't believe it either. So it, it has that classroom management aspect to it that I really enjoy and I've, I've manipulated it a lot of as well. The idea of sending out quizzes and quick polls. Um, what I found was that about 25 years ago, we started to get more and more pressure from administrators to do formative assessment. And for math teachers, that's a really tough thing to do. Whereas this makes that entire formative assessment piece quite easy. I think you saw that Doug um, managed to bring up some things that, that were really easily done altogether. Uh, before I go on, uh, Mike, is there anything in the chat that I needed to address that we needed to address? Fred, so far it looks uh, pretty good. I think all the questions that have been asked, I think have been answered. But uh, if anyone has any questions, feel free to put those in the Q&A or the chat and uh, we'll get to them. Good. Thanks so much. All right. So I am going to oh, one, stop presenter here. And there was one little detail that Doug didn't mention and that's the checkbox here with show the names. And I didn't so want to embarrass anybody tonight, Fred, but I always okay. used it for my darlings because I needed to know which child needed some extra attention for me. Mm -hmm. Years ago, we phrased that slightly different. So this shows me the kids' screens, but it also underneath it shows me the names of the kids. Um, and as Doug mentioned, the auto refreshes every 15 seconds. There is a, a refresh key over here. If I wanted to do it more frequently than that. And as I said, I use that extensively to keep track of what kids are doing and um, what they're not supposed to be doing. <clears throat> a few minutes ago, Doug mentioned the um, activity that we did. Excuse me a second. Called height and arm span. Um, and I, I did the same activity that he did with the same dimensions, the physical dimensions. And I had uh, some problems at the time because we didn't have any kind of technology other than typing into a spreadsheet where we could do this. And I had to put all this data in. And I wanted to collect all the data for all the grade nine kids in my school at that time. Um, so I had 125 kids that I had to put data in for. And I, I separated the boys and the girls' data. So if you look at this table, it has all of the data for the kids. And it goes down to 125 rows. Now, in case you think kids in Canada are giants, this is all done in centimeters because I find, well, not only we've been a metric country since 1973, but also trying to get kids to convert feet and inches to some one single measurement inches is kind of difficult and nobody thinks of you know, 5.6 feet. So uh, centimeters work an awful lot easier for me for that. So this is a fairly large set of data. And I want you to just watch what happens when I send this out to the class. That's already on the calculators. If I go to the class capture, I notice in that screen that I just went past quickly, I did not check logged in only. So the teacher is part of my class and the teacher is not logged. Again, that's why you're seeing this black screen over here. So let's take a look at one of these, just to give you an example of what types of things we can do with this. And I want Alan's screen, sorry, Ray's screen. So 
So Ray has opened up this data. I'm going to make him the presenter. And he goes on to the next page, which is the spreadsheet. And obviously, the data was all mixed up because it came in from different kids at different times. So it's really not very clean. So what I would have them do is to create a spreadsheet or it's add a new page for data and statistics. And for those of you who may recognize this, this is a small statistical package. Uh, it looks an awful lot like Fathom because it was written by the same person who wrote that software 25 years ago. And there's all my data. And I would tell the kids, does your data look exactly like mine? And of course, nobody's does because the points are placed randomly on the screen. There's no order to that whatsoever. It's probably one of the best lessons of randomness that you can do. So I'm going to instruct Raymond to come down to the bottom where it says click to add variable and actually click there and to choose one of those variables. Now you have a conversation about which one's the independent variable. That's fine. I'm going to choose height here and the points will realign. And the kids love watching those points realign like this. And then I come over to the side. And on the left side, there's another caption that says data variable. Oops, already done height. Let's choose arm span here. And this software aligns the window around your data automatically. And what I'm trying to get out of this is that there's a linear pattern. And obviously, somebody put in a piece of data with the incorrect numbers. Now, I don't know what this kid did at that time, but even a grade nine child is not that small. I don't care how small yours are when they come in. Nobody is that tiny coming into grade nine, I hope. They'd probably be tormented terribly. Okay. So I'm going to stop presenter here. That's just another example of data aggravation. And I'm going to now take a look at this creature that Doug mentioned a few minutes ago called Portfolio. It's been more, more than a few minutes ago, Fred. That was back when we first started. Yeah. Now, I'm just going to go back into my class tab for a moment. These are all the different activities that I've done with this class. Um, when I was mentioning the classroom management thing and, and the expectations of, of um, administrators sometimes, this is something that, that really helps me as well. It shows me all the different things that I've done. So I've actually been using this technology quite a bit. And if I go over to portfolio, there's some different assessments that I have sent out to my kids. So I'm going to take a look at some things. This column on the left is the assessment that Doug sent out. And we only had one student participate in this, and Ray got 67% on this question. So let's take a look at just this particular activity. And this gives me some ideas on some things that I can do to manipulate totals. I may decide that you know, question four was really kind of tough. So I'm going to give that a weight of zero. And it reassesses everything for each student. It allows me to go in and do that type of massaging that you might want to sometimes do. And I've got other different things in here. For Ray, he may have, oops, I gave that one a weight of zero. But if he answered this question correctly or I wanted to reassess it, I could change his, his grade in here by double clicking in this field and changing his grade. Okay. Let's see what else I've got here. Well, one of the things um, I used to do, Fred, was when I was giving quizzes, every question was not weighted the same. So I would mm -hmm. go back and say, well, question two is a five-point question. Uh, question six might be a uh, eight-point question. So I could, by default, it makes it one. I can quickly go back and weight them the, the weight that I feel that they, they have that value. And okay. it will automatically update everybody's score to, to weight it that, 
that that amount. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, so this one here, you notice that in this one, excuse me, I'll keep quick looking around here. I didn't send this to an awful lot of the kids. So if I wanted to, I could find this file where I collected it. And the next day, because I, I'm in the same class session, these two or options down here, send missing and collected missing, are not active right now. But if I were to stop the class as if it were going in the next day, those two things would be now active, and I could send that out to the class, and it would only go to the students who missed it the day before. Okay, now, back to my agenda, transfer tool. I want you to think back to the days when a new operating system came up. And I go back to the TI-83s and 84s, Doug goes back to the 82s and, and back into history that way. Um, but to update an operating system was a major task. You had to uh, send it either from calculator to calculator, computer to calculator, and you did one at a time. So if I were to stop the class, there's a tools menu up here, and you'll see this thing is, so I'm going to stop my class for a second. And I got a message on all my calculators that the class has ended. And I tell kids that doesn't mean you can leave. And there's this device called the transfer tool. And I can go to the class list. I can go to workshop files. So I might want this function match question to go out to all of the calculators. And I want it to go into a particular folder. And that's going to happen when I start the transfer. Now, to the transfer list, I can also add a new operating system. We are working with operating system, I think, something like 5.3, Doug? I believe so. There's a new one coming out in the fall. And one of the big advantages to that is that the Python programming language is going to be included as part of the operating system. And if you teach coding, you may want to try that with your kids. So that could be added in to the transfer list and done. But here's another one of the neat little things. There's a little checkbox up here that says delete all files and folders before the transfer. Now I'm not going to do that because what that would effectively do is completely wipe out every file and every folder I've ever put on the calculator. But if I were in a classroom situation where I was doing a test the next day, this is a really valuable tool. I can wipe all the calculators out just before the test begins. You you mean you had students figure out how to put cheat sheets in their calculator? Not my children. My kids would never have done that. Well, mine would have. This this is what I loved. I could clear the calculator, so if those who thought they would put a formula sheet in the calculator, it's now gone before the quiz or test. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Now, even though it, it didn't happen this year, along comes a state test, and you have to prepare the calculators in a certain way. You've got to put them into test mode. Now, quite often, kids will hold calculators the way they hold a phone, and they will put their thumb down on the escape key on the left-hand side and press the on button with their thumb on the right-hand side, and that puts the calculator into press to test mode. And they do it accidentally. And of course, when you ask them what happens, I didn't do a thing. It just happened. It's the way I found it. But if you need to intentionally do that, then you can go to this icon that says prepare handhelds at the top. And you can enter press to test. 
Now I've got three boxes checked off, limit geometry functions, disable inequality graphing, and disable implicit graphing, because those are the three that the state of Texas mandates for its teachers, and I was coaching in Texas up until the early part of March. So if I enter press to test, it's going to go out to the navigator system and it is resetting all of my calculators. And bear with me for a second. I can see them coming back and when they return, I'm going to have a lock at the top of the screen. I get a message that press to test has been activated and I now see a lock at the top to indicate that I can no longer access files and folders. Now getting calculators into press to test mode wasn't that big a deal. You, you could actually do it fairly quickly, but getting them out was just horrendous. So what the product developers did is they did the opposite. And I can exit press to test in exactly the same way. I shouldn't have clicked the uh, done portion down there, but all my calculators are resetting and coming back. In the same way, you can set up your calculators with some default settings that you choose, and you can give that uh, your, your setup a name as well. So you can choose all of these things in case calculators get messed up, you can send that out. What we're hoping in the future is that it does some things for geometry as well. Um, I like to have points automatically labeled, and that would be a feature I'd like to see added too. Now, this one. There are two different lines of thought about Scratchpad. Some people think it's the best thing that we've ever put into the device, and some people think it's the absolute worst. That's me. And, yeah. And very few people sit in between those two positions. So this will clear out the scratch pads on the five calculators. And I get a message on each one of them that says scratch pad has been cleared. And the only issue with that, correct me if I'm wrong, Doug, is that it doesn't clear what's in there at that moment. Or does it? No, it does now. I okay. believe so. Okay. Good to know. Okay. So we've run through a number of different things here. And I'm just going to begin my class. So bear with me a moment. I'm just going to have a student log in. And while Fred's logging in that student, the reason why you're seeing the red and the green, Fred had clicked upon where we were deleting that file. And if it occurred safely and correctly, the person shows up in green. If it shows up in red, that didn't happen. And the reason why the teacher is in red was because they didn't have the file, therefore it couldn't be deleted. Uh, there's another color that would show up would be uh, yellow, which means there was some type of communication problem. So that's why they're showing up colors for that. And if Fred would click on a different uh, activity there in the class record, uh, the colors would change based upon who did what in that, that session there. Like that? Yep, like that, Fred. Okay. So this indicates that the two in green, this was successful. Yes. And for the three in red, this activity was not successful. Let me try something. This is data that I collected from my kids. And it came in in vastly different orders. Now, what I would do when I was in the classroom is I would have chips. We used to call them poke. For chips. And what I would do is I would have um, labels on the chips. I would have, say, a blue one that was zero. And I would have uh, red ones that were negative numbers. And they'd each have a label on them. And black ones that 
or positive numbers because in accounting, in the red is negative and black is positive. Okay. And I would um, have kids come in and pick up a chip. And they knew every time they did that, that we were going to do some kind of function. And it was going to be something different. And then I would give them instructions. So I might say something like, take your number, double it, and add two. And they would do that. And the number that they got is their X value. And the, the result that they got is their Y value. And they would submit that. And I would develop the idea of functions in that particular manner. This may or may not have been an activity related to that, but let's see what happens. If I send this out to my class, and in the class tab, you can see that that's only gone out to the student. By the way, I could have changed my format here for names. So I see their first names instead. And I'm getting Ramon to open this. And this is really good for showing kids the first time you do things. Do I want to save changes to high man? I never want kids to save. Everything you do in math is valuable, but it's not necessarily worth saving. So I'm going to choose no here. Now, let's take a look at the data. And as I did a few minutes ago, I'm going to go to Control Doc or Control I or back to the home page. But I'm going to add in a new page for data and statistics. Okay, here's my random numbers. Not as many as before. And I'm going to come down here and click data variable. Put the X's on the horizontal scale. Put the Y's on the vertical scale. Now, what I hope kids realize with this is that we've got mostly a linear pattern, except there's one piece of data here that doesn't fit. And it looks like that's got an X value of two. And what I want the kids to do is to go back into the table. And please don't ever say that I said this. Don't ever repeat this to a stats teacher. I'm going to change the data. That is sacrosanct to So I'm going to go up and click on page 1.1. And it looks like the relationship was double your X value and add one. And let's scroll down. I'm going to see if I can find this one. And there's the result. It's a problem. This child put in two and two for their answer. And that should be a five. And the nice thing about this is that as soon as I make that change in the data, that's dynamic and it produces the same kind of result. It updates the uh, the graph on the right hand side. Now, it looks to me like this dead piece of data might be as wrong as well. I might take a minute to go back to that. Yeah, that should have been a three. And it presents a visual method of looking at a set of data to see if it makes sense. Kids are pretty good at this if you give them a chance. And if you've never seen this, I'm going to go to menu. I'm going to go to Analyze. I want to fit a line to that. One way is to add a movable line and get the kids to manipulate it. Another way is to go down to Regression and choose Show Linear. And there's my regression. And all of that can be done very nicely through Navigate. They're getting stuff out to them, getting stuff in from them, sending it back out, and getting to analyze it as a group and contribute to the lesson. Okay. Doug, I have lost my supply of this. Well, 
We're we're nearing the wit- witching hour, and and Mike wants to wrap this up. So he's got a few more things he needs to tell and talk to the uh, participants this evening before we call it a night. So uh, I just want to make before I turn it to Mike, just say hey. I've had a blast. Hopefully, you've seen uh, what we think are some of the top ten reasons and top ten features of Navigator. Uh, and hopefully, if this is the first time you've seen it, uh, you'll get hooked like we are. And if you're a, a, a user already, hopefully, we showed you something that you can add to your repertoire. Thanks, Fred. Thanks, Doug. And I'm making you the presenters. Perfect. So as we begin to wrap things up yeah. tonight, if you do have any last minute questions for Fred or Doug, uh, please send those in, although they'll do their best to try and get those last minute questions answered. One thing I do want to share, uh, if this is your first professional development webinar, uh, is where to get more of them. So if you visit our webpage, education.ti.com, and under the professional development tabs at the bottom is webinars, you can slide down and check out any of our live upcoming webinars, or you can select any of the on-demand webinars. This is not the first uh, Navigator-specific webinar we've done, uh, so you can filter out the on-demand webinars and just focus on just the Navigator-specific webinars, if that's something that would interest you. But if you click on Live Webinars, you can see some of the upcoming webinars we have over the next few weeks here. We are still populating this for the fall, uh, so have no fear. We have more webinars coming other than the August 25th webinar. Uh, we have webinars all the way through, uh, through the holidays. To receive a certificate, go ahead and click that link that just appeared in the chat window. Also listed is a link for the documents that were used tonight. Uh, one thing that uh, I got to give a shout out to Doug that he did that I really appreciate uh, is he was he took a bunch of pictures of people using Navigator and what it looks like in the classroom. So uh, if you're still a little kind of uh, interested in, in what that may actually look like, uh, feel free to download our documents from tonight. Uh, again, in there are a bunch of images of the Navigator being used by, uh, by students and teachers in the classroom. And if you're watching this on demand, go ahead and copy that link into your favorite browser to receive your certificate. And if you miss those links for any reason, just hang tight. You'll automatically get a follow-up email within a couple of days and that follow-up email will contain links for the certificate, the documents, and the recording. So you can go back and view this at your own pace. Feel free to stay connected with us on any of the major social media outlets. And if you're in need of any post-webinar follow-up, feel free to give us a call at 1-800-TI-CARES or drop us an email, ti-cares at ti.com. We'd love to hear from you. Lastly, when you leave the webinar tonight, a brief survey will automatically appear in your browser. Your feedback really guides us as we plan future online events. So we really hope you share your thoughts in that post-webinar survey. Big thanks to uh, Doug and Fred for everything you shared tonight. We really appreciate it. Our pleasure. Enjoyed it immensely. And again, we couldn't do this without uh, everyone joining us tonight, so we uh, thank everyone for, for joining us, and I want you all to stay safe, and we hope to see you back online next week. Have a great night.